Hey there, welcome to YouTube. If you are into poetry, if you are into literature, if you are into cultural history, then you've come to the right place. Cardboard Box Productions makes podcasts about all those things, so be sure to click the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell so that you never miss a new episode. Obviously, we mostly make podcasts, so you can also go to anywhere you get your podcasts, if it's a, a place other than YouTube, uh, like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and you can subscribe to our podcast feeds there. All right, I hope you enjoy this episode. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Close Talking, the world's most popular poetry analysis podcast from Cardboard Box Productions Incorporated. I am co-host Jack Rossiter Munley, and with my good friend Connor McNamara Stratton, we read a poem, talk about the poem, and read the poem again. Before we get into today's selection, a quick note that if you like what we do here at Close Talking and have a spare minute of your time, it would mean the world to us if you would give the podcast a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Those ratings and reviews help boost us up the algorithm and find new listeners. And if you have suggestions for future episodes or comments on this one, you can send us an email at closetalkingpoetry at gmail.com. And you can also find us on social media. On Twitter, the show is at Close Talking. I am at Jack Rossiter Munn, and Connor is at Connor M. Stratton. On Instagram, the show is at Close Talking Poetry, and on Facebook, it's facebook.com slash close talking. We also have a website, closetalking.com, where you can find all the past episodes of the show, and Cardboard Box Productions has just launched a newsletter, Unboxed, and if you go to cardboardboxproductionsinc.com, you can subscribe for more behind-the-scenes stuff on Close Talking and all of the other literary and cultural history podcasts that Cardboard Box Productions makes. On with the show. Welcome to an all-new episode of Close Talking. I am one of your co-hosts, Connor McNamara Stratton. And I am your other co-host, Jack Rossiter Munley. And we are here to wish you a happy new year. Happy new this year! Is our... Happy new year! Woo! Okay, it's going to be like 15 days into that or something, so... You know, the, the glory will have faded and No, no. Oh the glory never fades. It is yeah. twenty shine teen, the year the light pierces the dark, and the glory never fades. <laughs> yes, also that. Also that. If I um, may quote Mavis Staples very briefly, we all have a little light. And what we're gonna do is get all our little lights together and create one big light. She said that a long time ago, but it's still true, and I love her very much. So 20 shine teen, the year the light pierces the dark. Everybody get those lights out from under those bushels because it's time to shine. 20 shine teen, 20 shine teen. And one way that you can make us shine is by going to your app and putting a little few stars, ideally five stars next to the rating and rate us. Because after our first desperate plea for ratings, we had started with five ratings, which was the bare minimum that you need to be even noticed on Apple iTunes. We are now at 10 ratings. That is literally 100% increase and um, has inspired me to return to pleading desperately. So if you have a moment, look down at your phone, unless you're driving, wait until you're done driving and uh, give us those five stars. Well, it's time to get to the poem. We've got another great poem. This is uh, one of my, I think, maybe all-time favorite poems. It is called Letter. It is by the poet Natasha Trethaway. She wrote the poetry collection Native Guard, which this poem is from, and that won the 2007 Pulitzer Prize for Poetry. And she was the 2012 Poet Laureate until 2014. She's great. I recommend all of Native Guard. It's so good. Uh, it's one of the tightest books I've read. Something that's really important about her is that she's from the South and she's not white. And the like literary canon of the South, I think, is often very white and is not often enough questioned for being so white. So when you think of like 
Southern literature. It's always like, you know, William Faulkner and um, Flannery Flannery O'Connor and like these Southern Gothics or Cormac McCarthy's early novels. It's like Southern Gothic, white men and women. And the fact that the South is the site of so much racial tension in American history and racial violence in American history is something that in the literary canon has often gone a little overlooked. And Natasha Trethewey as a writer is very interested in that, writes a lot about it, and has over the course of her career sort of written herself into that history in different places. In her poem, Miscegenation, she talks about this quite a bit. And she talks about Faulkner characters and her own history and her parents' marital history and like has has given a lot of thought about this, wrote a book about the Civil War, like has really delved into this. And as somebody who is not white and from the South, I just think it's really important that she is out there doing what she does. And I think it corrects a great imbalance. I think that's really right. And yeah, it's, she's native guard. Um, this poem specifically doesn't touch as sort of explicitly on race, but a, a lot of it concerns those themes. And and specifically too, her mother was black and her dad was white. And so she thinks a lot about being biracial and sort of occupying this kind of like both, but then neither of these spaces. Um, before we get into the poem, one bit of biographical information uh, that's particularly relevant for this poem is her mother uh, died um, when she was in college. So this is Letter by Natasha Trethewey. At the post office, I dash a note to a friend, tell her I've just moved in, gotten settled, that I'm now rushing off on an errand except that I write errant, a slip between letters, each with an upright backbone anchoring it to the page. One has with it the fullness of possibility, a shape almost like the O my friend's mouth will make when she sees my letter in her box. The other, a mark that crosses like the flat line of your death the symbol over the church house door, the ashes on your forehead some Wednesday I barely remember. What was I saying? I had to cross the word out, start again, explain what I know best because of the way you left me. How suddenly a simple errand, a letter, everything can go wrong. I love this poem. This is a really good one. Can I just say, so it makes a lot of sense to me that this might be one of your all-time favorite poems. Oh, really? Um, Do I have gonna, a... I'm going to posit a theory, and then you tell me what you think. So oh it God. does something that she does in, in quite a few of her poems that I think is something you tend to enjoy, which is that she's taking like a little word idea and really digging into what these words are all about in a very uh, kind of granular way. So obviously letter has a couple of meanings in the poem. It's like sending a letter and the difference of one letter, the D or the T. Um, So there's like double meanings going on, but specifically it's getting into like the errand, errant, very minor distinction with a big meaning in it. And also just like reaching into syntax and words and trying to pull out what's going on in them, which she does in a couple other poems. She has a poem called Meditation at Decatur Square, where she's like doing very similar kinds of stuff with words. She even mentions the syntax of monuments as a way of talking about the buildings there. In her poem, Miscegenation, she really gets into like Sin Sinati and talking about sin and then Mississippi miss uh like really getting into that. And that's something I think I think you like in in when poems do. <laughs> and uh yeah. Is that oh, wow. am I onto something here? I just got called out hard and fast. Wow. Um I think that's probably right. I think I probably like that specifically more than your average poem lover but i think that this poem is a is a great example of taking sort of the most sort of elemental aspect of language specifically like letters themselves and using that super small thing to make to express something very profound i think i do 
have a penchant for that. There's a couple other things that I noticed that I like because I have things that I like that are related, but I'm not going to keep calling myself out because, you know, we got to got to keep it chill. I mean, if you're going to um, do it, what am I here for? <laughs> <laughs> true. True. Well, that now I feel all right. I'll have to deflect attention. Um, well, <laughs> I mean, it's all a good thing. I, I mean, I, I, I like this about you and it's something I appreciate about the way that you read poems because you pull out so many interesting and like really fascinating details to dig into. Um, it just occurred to me as I was reading it and particularly listening to you read it. It was like, oh yeah, I can see why you might like this. <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. Um, yeah. And, uh, probably before we get going uh any deeper in the poem it's i think a fairly straightforward poem but it's always helpful i think to do a little bit of a, a summary or a plot basically we have a speaker who's writing a letter to a friend and uh they're saying that they're gonna go on an errand but they sort of miswrite the word errand and instead write the word errant and this like mistake in writing makes them think about a bunch of things and they're kind of thinking about the differences between the shape of the letter D and the shape of the letter T. And that sort of leads them to think about specifically there's mother passing away. We have the a mark that crosses, which is the letter T, like the flat line of your death. Then the speaker sort of like catches themselves and is like, what was I saying? Then kind of goes back to the original moment of the poem when she makes the mistake uh, and had to, she has to cross it out and sort of explain what I know best because of the way you left me, how suddenly a simple errand, a letter, everything can go wrong. So that's pretty much, yeah, I think that the, the poem probably takes about only like five or 10 seconds. If you think about the actual events of the poem, the speaker, all the speaker does is try to write, I'm going to rush off on an errand, but then writes errant, then has to cross out errant and write errand and then jot some explanation note. That's sort of all that happens. But then, you know, within that, you know, we get, we get the rest of the poem. So I'm curious You've already called out about, you know, what I like about the poem. Uh, so my work here is done, but I'm curious what uh, what you think about. What are your thoughts about these, this poem? I'm, I'm just putting out my theory as to why you might enjoy it since you offered, <laughs> particularly since I got a little bit called out on my previous pick for its similarities to a, to a certain other poems I picked. Whatever. It's true. We're doing some calling out. We're doing some calling Watch out. Watch out. After the 50th episode, you start to get to know each other a little bit or something. <laughs> Or like the first 10 years of friendship or something longer than that. Whatever. <laughs> there were a couple of things that really struck me about this poem. I also really liked it. In going through the little narrative of it, as you said, it, it takes place over about five seconds, but there's so much going on because it really does a good job of getting that moment of a mistake that then triggers a bunch of thoughts in your head as you quickly fix it and then go off to do something else. You still have this like bang moment within your mind at least i know that happens to me sometimes where like a whole bunch of thoughts just kind of condense right away because something happened to fall a certain way and it feels to me like that's kind of what happened here like she made this mistake writing a note and then thought like oh dang but there is a moment within it as you were talking about the narrative where there's there is this kind of change particularly where she starts talking about the differences between the two letters talking about the o which is like the positive the friend surprised mouth when she sees the letter in her box and then there's this switch when she's thinking about the t and that switch kind of lingers through the rest of the poem i felt in an interesting way because it says the other a mark that crosses like the flat line of your death the symbol over the church house door so all of a sudden this like deep sadness almost comes out of nowhere um, it makes sense because it's in thinking about the letter. Of course, a T looks like a cross and it makes a natural bridge to this very different subject. But all of a sudden there's this real hard turn towards like, oh, wait, there's like a lot of loss. There's something different going on here. At least for me, that was like a big shift. But even after she says, what was I saying? As though getting back on track immediately after that, the word cross comes in again. And I thought that right there was like a little moment for me of genius because it indicates that this moment of like sadness and reflection doesn't go away even when she tries to get back on track with this sort of minute task of fixing the word that was written wrong, getting back to heading out the door. The poem ends still very much in that more contemplative, sadder 
space. Yeah. Oh, I like that a lot. I like that a lot, a lot. And I love how the D is the, the thing that she tries to write, but then what she ends up writing by mistake is the T, which is like the cross or the flat line of the speaker's mother's death. And this is sort of, and I had mentioned this sort of before we read the poem, but, you know, the speaker's mother died very suddenly. And so this kind of like mistake of writing the sort of arbitrariness of that when writing the the word wrong the consequences aren't that great but the sort of arbitrariness is a as a kind of microcosm of the the arbitrariness of the speaker's mother's death i have a kind of crazy theory idea strangeness thing that maybe is not a crazy theory idea strangeness thing but it might be a crazy idea strangest thing i want to hear your crazy idea strange thing and then we'll see how crazy it is okay we'll see we'll see how it is it starts very big in which i make a claim about art and poetry (laughs) all right bring it Um, which, which has made which is not my claim but is a claim that has been made many times but that one way or one role that that poems have or one thing that they try to accomplish is to sort of allow the reader or the listener to access another's experience or to try to, you know, bridge the gap between two people's experiences um, so that someone isn't just sort of knowing the facts of a situation, but in some in some way is like experiencing it viscerally, whether or not that's like in the shoes of the person or just like feeling like you were there in some kind of way. So forms of art, I think, have different ways of doing that. But one of poetry's big techniques is association and the bringing of unlike things together. Uh, There's a great interview that I referenced previous episode that I don't recall which one, um, with Stuart Dybeck, who's a writer, short story writer and a poet. And he sort of has this great bit about the lyrical, um, which is kind of the main mode, as he calls it, of the genre poetry. He says, the lyrical works like a dream does through association, metaphorical thinking. Poetry is for bringing together of unrelated things. Yeah, I just really love that a lot. And so I think this poem is interesting because it uses association very heavily, but in a way that's sort of more intense, I think, or accentuated than other poems. But we get the sort of central association is the mistaken word, writing errant, seeing the word T, and then associating that with, um, you know, the flat line of your death and sort of getting from this word to this experience of loss. And so this poem is, you know, an elegy. It's a poem about her mother in some ways and about the the loss of it. And, okay, but there's two things in the content and then there's two things in the form. And I think they work together. So the poem is in part about the arbitrariness of just events, things happening. The death was arbitrary. The experience, or the poem is also about the arbitrariness, as you were talking about, of grieving in some ways. You see something, it reminds you of something. You know, you're you're walking, you see a sign, it reminds you of your mother. Suddenly, you know, you're thinking about that. And in that split second, you know, in your own association, you you go to that that place. And the poem is both using association and it's also sort of about association, which is which is kind of crazy. I think I just said a little too much and there's more there and I don't want to get too far down the rabbit hole. But I'm curious what you think about my crazy idea that as soon as I said it, I realized it was a pretty normal idea. And uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I like it a lot. I mean, it's really cool. One of the things I did notice earlier is that this poem does a really good job of exactly that. It makes these like what would seem to be super tenuous connections, like you're the connections that someone with a lot of personal context makes for themselves about something. But it does a really good job of bringing you as a reader along 
for that sort of cognitive leap experience, um, which is something that like Ross Gay does really, really well in a lot of his poems. Um, and it kind of put me in mind of some of his work in that way, where he starts in one place and just like all of a sudden ends up somewhere completely different. And you're like, it makes perfect sense how I got here, but what the hell happened in the middle? Like, how did I get here? Like I, the experience of getting here felt normal, but I barely remember where I started, which is sort of the experience I had when I was um, reading this poem. Um, but in what you were talking about and talking about the sort of, again, getting into this idea of the O as like being part of the D and the D and the T as being these two different letters, there's also this space in the poem of them kind of existing together, which I think is potentially interesting because the T was written by mistake and is crossed out. And then the D also exists. And the D is the one that is intended. And then the one that is also left at the end, theoretically, it doesn't explicitly say that she wrote it again, but like we're led to believe that it was the errant was crossed out and errand was written, which in the context of loss and grief, it's sort of like, Yes, the moment of loss is this intense, you know, the cross and the church and you're stuck in that like less open, more severe letter T, but eventually you do get to the the open, more open D, the O of your friend's mouth preserved with the backbone behind it. Like there's a lot more possibility there. It literally says one has with it the fullness of possibility, a shape almost like the O my friend's mouth will make. In the poem, the D is imbued with a lot of this kind of quality, which I think is interesting, particularly to have them existing together because it's sort of getting at how a big event like a loss can eventually be in some ways transformed into the more creative or the the more open to possibilities. And there's an element of grieving or any kind of big emotional moment that it's kind of like, as you were saying, sort of aggregating. Like, I feel like sometimes people think about when you grow up, then you become like an adult, which is like the ideal form of yourself that you're forming. But another way to think about it that I think um, there's a kind of field of psychology that thinks about it this way that I'm going to butcher, but that basically you have a mu bunch of different selves within you. Um, and so you always have your child self and you always have your teenage self and you always have, you know, this self from this moment in your life. And there's certain instances that kind of like can trigger those selves to like emerge. So like, someone who had something really hard, you know, when they were a kid, if there's something that reminds them of that, they might suddenly act as though they were the age that they were when that happened or something like that. And in that way, becoming a person isn't just like this one unified self, but this sort of accumulation of selves or something, which feels similar. I was thinking of, this is maybe just like a random association, but it reminded me of the or the D that became a T that then became a D, but the T was still there and the D was intended, or that there's these crossing out of things, and but each each one is still sort of present on the page. Um, I like that a whole lot. Sort of a biographical thing on her that I think is almost 100% what led me down this road is that what she credits for getting her really into poetry. Her father is a poet of some repute and a, and was a, a creative writing teacher and still writes and it's something that they share together. Um, there's a really cool interview of her with Roseanne Cash sort of talking about what it meant to have these fathers in creative fields that they both also then like went into. We'll be sure to put a link to that up. It's really, really cool. Um, but she gave a talk, she mentions it in that interview, but she gave a talk where she explicitly talks about this called Necessary Utterance Poetry as a Cultural Force. And she talks about how she herself really got into writing poetry again. She wrote a lot when she was a kid and then kind of went away from it, did other things, still interested in creative writing. But what got her back into it actually was in the wake of her mother's death, she found the Auden poem Musée de Beaux-Arts at one point, And that was like a really meaningful discovery for her. And reading that had a big impact on her. And in this talk, she talks about how she made this list of words that she then kind of used as ideas. They were like, it was like a list of things that helped her start to like think through her 
grief, one of which was Orpheus and Eurydice. So she wanted to capture. But one of the other things she says that she wrote down on that paper was errand errant. So this difference of these letters was something that made that list of things that helped her in thinking about and contextualizing the loss of her mom. It sounded like in this talk, you can we'll put a link to it. You can listen to it and everything she's written. She's also very interested in the idea of eulogies because a lot of her poems, I think she feels a little bit are like eulogies for her mother's loss. She even wrote a poem called eulogy for her father, who is not or at least was not at the time of her writing dead, but it was eulogizing an element of their relationship or sort of a thing that they would do that is no longer around. So these are like ideas that crop up a lot in her work. And I thought it was particularly interesting that this errand errant idea was there very early on. And it got me to thinking about what did that really mean as something that was helping her work through this? And I, it felt a little bit like, obviously, an errand that goes wrong could be an errand on which you go out and like you have a fatal accident on, on the sort of basic level. But it's also, it felt a little bit like out of the loss of her mother finding Auden's Musée de Beaux-Arts and really getting into poetry as an adult. I mean, she ended up becoming Poet Laureate. She's won Guggenheim Fellowships. Like, this is her life now. And it sounded in the way she was talking about it like a lot of that came out of the ways that she was working through the loss of her mother whoa that is so cool i did not know that also errant is the perfect word because it's you're going off the path that you were supposed to be going on is when something's errant so the the mistake the the errant pen as it were making the word errant is is like the perfect but then as yeah as you were saying it's not necessarily it's still a path it's and it can be very fruitful in that way and it's the way that poems work too is kind of this errant associative manner um, which i think is something that she's talking about in this poem it's kind of what she literally does in this poem because it's going in one direction and then it almost sharply you don't feel it as particularly sharp, but it does make a fairly hard turn away from the direction it's going in, which is this sort of, oh, I made a mistake when I was writing and my friend will be so surprised when she gets my letter and, oh, hey, what about death? The flat line of your death, the symbol over the church house door, the ashes on your forehead some Wednesday, I barely remember, like, boom, 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 just hits you one after another. And all of a sudden, you're way off the path you were originally on in this poem. Yeah, and and I think, Kind of returning a little bit, maybe with our our added wisdom. You know, one one thing that the poem does is it 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 takes you along an associative path in the same way that the speaker is going on an associative path. So you're you're sort of walking these twin paths together, and then the move that happens when the poem goes, "What was I saying?" This is another thing, and this is when I'm going to call myself out. <laughs> this is when the poem becomes like explicitly self-reflexive. The poem stops in its tracks and it's like, I was going somewhere, but where where was I going? Um, It's like the poem is sort of being written as you're reading it. And that's sort of the effect that it produces. And so the poem is self-reflexive in that it's aware of itself happening. And it makes the twin paths that you were following before kind of suddenly charged, perhaps where you can sort of experience the same thing that the speaker is kind of experiencing because you've been sort of walking along and now you're both quote unquote aware of the same thing, which is why I think like whenever I read this, when I get to like, I had to cross the word out, start again, and then explain what I know best. And then there's this line break that goes into the, and a stanza break, it goes into the last stanza. That's like the moment when I start to get like chills a little bit. I mean, I feel like it's just a just a devastating end. But I can just imagine the challenge of, you know, how do you capture both the pain of a loss, being a loss, but also being so arbitrary, and then also the pain of having to experience the grief so arbitrarily all the time and and those two things happening together you know that they're bound up in each other for this speaker and i think that the way that the the poem makes itself self-reflexive at the end 
makes the poem able to be associative and be about association. And those two things can allow it to capture both of those like pains that the speaker is going through. There's also the yeah. like specific pain of the seemingly, I don't know, casual statement, explain what I know best. And what is it that the speaker knows best? It is unexpected grief. Like I, I know this kind of mistake best because I've experienced this horrible thing that was kind of the same thing in this specific way. Another aspect sort of to try to return back to my little weird abstract idea about what poetry does. The reason I was trying to think about the reason why association is like interesting or like an effective way. And I, and you know, it's the bringing together of these two things. I think that it's important that they be sort of in tension with each other. These unlike things like, um, the tension between the unlike things, I think, is the productive part of an association. And there's like a million different ways to do this. And we've, we've sort of talked about this in, in lots of ways. So the I poem, uh, Gotta Stop Loving You So I Killed My Black Goat, which is a poem title so long that I always think I'm going to forget it. But then it's so crazy that I never forget it. Yeah, but in that poem by I... There's kind of the two things that are the grief over the lost relationship and the sacrificial goat ritual. And in there we talked about sort of the tension. Those are unlike things, but sort of what makes it work is there's a kind of maybe sacred and profane and that that tension is kind of what makes the poem work. And I think the way that the, that, I think that I don't really know, but my one idea as I was sitting here thinking about it was that when you have this tension, the reader really wants to make meaning out of things because, and really wants to get it. But because they're so unlike, they don't make immediate sense, right? And so the reader has to do imaginative work to kind of like go somewhere where they can make sense out of it. Like in some ways you could think about it as you have your two things and their two poles. And then if they're unlike, they make a little rubber band and you can pull the reader back with that tension from the rubber band held in place by those two things that are in tension. And then you release them and then they cross the boundary into the speaker's experience, maybe. I feel like the way that this poem because it's self-reflexive and because it's sort of about association itself in some kind of way. So like one thing that you actually see is how the speaker themselves sort of cross that boundary through their own association. They make the writing mistake and then think about the loss of their mother and then are kind of catapulted into that last stanza where they say, you know, how suddenly a simple errand a letter, everything can go wrong. I did not do this, but if I were teaching again, which I hope that I will in the future, this would be like a perfect poem to teach association because it both uses it and it's about it. And so I think it, it, it's very illustrative in that way. And it's just amazing and makes me feel a lot of things. The last little bit that I had to do another full circle, because I'm really trying to, I'm trying to throw some things in the air, and then we're going to run around, and then I was trying to catch the thing later. Like like the parachute thing in gym class, where you like the whole class throws it up, and you have to like run under it, and then run back out from under it? I don't remember how that worked, but like that. I think, I think exactly like that. All right. So cool. the last parachute is the Stuart Dybeck interview where he's talking about the lyrical and he was talking about how it's the bringing together of unlike objects. But the other thing that he said was that one other effect of the lyric is that it slows down time and that that's a really sort of important part of the lyric. And we talked about this, I think when we talked about the Harper's monologue from Angels in America and how and I think maybe that's when I brought up the interview, but how that monologue was so 
rich and lyrical and kind of slowed everything down uh, for a moment. But one way that I think about just like, what does it mean to slow down time? Cause it's like, that just sounds kind of cool. But then I'm like, what is it? It's just like, if you ever think about the end of a play or the end of a movie, and it's like, there's that moment that they just hold that moment, like something weird happens with the lights or like music is going on or, you know, they're, they're saying either like slower or they're not really advancing the plot. And the moment itself might be pretty short, but it, it suddenly occupies this much larger space in kind of the, the arc of the movie. And those are, I think, kind of like purely lyrical moments. And they, they kind of slow down the experience for the viewer. I just think this is another perfect example of that because we have this event that is the shortest event you can write about, which is like misspelling a word and then crossing it out and then writing a little bit more. But within that very short amount of time, we have sort of this huge, complex emotional experience. And we sort of achieve that experience through the associative logic of the poem. That's like what allows us to get there. The parachute of Dybeck has descended upon us. I love the idea of Dybeck's parachute. I'm very into it. <laughs> I think we should try and popularize that term in academic circles. So reading this poem, I, I thought of two other poems, one of which I thought of for exactly this reason, because of the way that it does sort of freeze a moment in time and like kind of wring some a, a lot of meaning out of it, which is the uh, Marie pa Howe poem that we talked about, What the Living Do, which is very similar in theme and kind of similar in that that poem Marie Howe's poem is literally about an errant errand where she's going out doing errands and then kind of catches a glimpse of herself in a storefront window and has this moment of realization that even though there are all these small frustrations and she's doing all these small things, she's doing all of them because she's alive and she thinks about the fact that her brother isn't and that in some way we are living, we remember you in being alive and in doing the stuff of life. She is in some way sort of paying homage to her brother's memory. And I felt sort of a similar. It just had a similar feel to it. It's dealing with similar subject matter in a little bit of a similar way and taking these very small, seemingly mundane moments and pulling out the meaning there. And probably because it's about letters, I also thought of the, uh, the Langston Hughes poem, I Love My Friend, which is just a really sweet, short poem. Um, I love my friend. He moved away from me. That's all there is to say. The poem ends soft as it began. I loved my friend, which it kind of, again, it's not the same subject matter, but that poem to me has always felt a little bit like a letter to someone, maybe an unsent letter, and also just has a similar feeling to it to me, to this poem, where it's a little bit commemorative, it's a little bit hopeful, it manages to have sort of what you were getting at. It's got that mixture that's really cool of having that sort of undercurrent of sadness, that undercurrent of grief and loss, but it still talks about how he loved his friend and like had this obviously very meaningful connection before he moved away, um, which I really liked. And it felt to me like a little bit of that was going on, which also puts me in mind of one of our mutual friends, uh, this wonderful man, Tom Donington, passed away a number of years ago, but who was very big influence on both Connor and myself. And he had this great quote that he said, which is that we take our joys and sorrows and mix them. And that's how we sort of come to wisdom. And it feels like that is also going on in this poem a little bit. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I was also thinking about Marie Howe in that poem too. Yeah, that's a great quote by Tom. We've been talking a lot about its sort of complexity of ideas, but it's also just an incredibly simple poem. Like you read through it and it's like, you get what's going on right away. There's not a lot of mystery about what's happening in it, I think. Uh, which yeah. in some ways I think allows you to access the complex ideas more easily, which is like a whole other level of brilliance. <laughs> so yeah, dang. no, that's a that's a great point because that we, you know we've talked about form and like loud forms and quiet forms, and I was thinking as I was talking about self reflexivity and all this stuff, it sounds all of a sudden like a loud form um, where like the form is the content or some kind of. Thing like that 
but I think that you're actually absolutely right that when you read it, the language is very plain. The syntax is very direct. There's no like difficult images that are like obscure. And so, you know, as you're going step by step, it doesn't seem to be anything that's like pulling out all its tricks and like shooting fireworks in the air. It's not sort of drawing attention to itself in that way. But the the kind of the things that it's doing are working sort of under the surface. Ugh, so good. It's just so good. It is it is incredibly good. Should we read it again? I think we should. All right. Letter. At the post office, I dash a note to a friend. Tell her I've just moved in, gotten settled, that I'm now rushing off on an errand. Except that I write errant, a slip between letters, each with an upright backbone anchoring it to the page. One has with it the fullness of possibility, a shape almost like the O my friend's mouth will make when she sees my letter in her box. The other, a mark that crosses like the flat line of your death, the symbol over the church house door, the ashes on your forehead some Wednesday I barely remember. What was I saying? I had to cross the word out. Start again. Explain what I know best because of the way you left me. How suddenly a simple errand, a letter, everything can go wrong. This is co-host Jack Roster Munley. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, head on over to Apple Podcasts. Leave a review. Five stars, maybe? Those reviews help with the algorithm and are a great way for us to find new listeners. And you can put anything in them. You can write whatever you want. You can just say, oh, this is a good podcast. I like this podcast. You could be like, hey, that Connor guy, he makes a lot of good points. Uh, Jack, why is he doing this outro so long? You know, get him off the mic. And whatever you feel like writing, head on over there. Five stars. Drop in the review. Uh, do you have thoughts about this poem? Is there a poem or poet you'd like us to cover on a future episode? Well, we'd love to hear from you. And there are tons of ways that you can get in touch with us. I mean, I guess you could drop it into an iTunes review. You could be like, five stars. Hey, why don't you talk about insert name of poet here? Um, but you can also send us an email. That's probably the best way to do it. Close talking poetry at gmail.com is our email address. Or you can find us on Twitter. I am at Jack Rossiter Munn. Connor is at Connor M. Stratton. And the show is at Close Talking. On Instagram, you can find us there too. Uh, we are at Close Talking Poetry. And we are on Facebook at facebook.com slash close talking. We haven't gotten to TikTok yet. And we might never. Who knows? Anything is, anything is possible. Um, speaking of all those social media platforms, a very special thank you to our incredible social media manager, Corey China, who keeps us active across the internet. And a thank you to all of you for listening. We will see you next time.